I turned it in, and and I was really, you know, more because we talked so much about Pollock and the time frame, um, but we did talk a little bit about that controversy over the show, and it, and it wasn't it, the assignment. What in a lot of ways wasn't so much about getting more information about Pollock as it was getting a sense of the time um, and sort of the tone of the writing. I hope also that you looked at the apps. Did you find anybody? Yeah, yeah. Kind of, yeah, right. And that's another reason it's nice to be able to see that in the facsimile of the magazine. What did, before we talked about the the, the you know, serious stuff, what do you think about the ads? They're points. <laughs> points. Points is an interesting word. What do you have? Do you have any good I mean, it's like I, like, I kind of like the throwback to the, like, the hand drawing and the three yeah. and stuff, mm -hmm. but then they're also kind of weird. Mm -hmm. so, or like, like the shaving ad with like, it's almost all of the woman and just like the man's face. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. I was like, who are you selling that to, really? But, you know, I put something, I mean, sex sells, you know, and that's, that, that doesn't change, you know, from the 50s until today, although we think of the 50s as a more <laughs> you know, time um, period than our, own, or than our own. But I think it's worth looking at the big cheese ad. Yeah, ad yeah. Kind of, you know, you're like, wow, you know. Um, yeah, so I think that, but to put that into the context of the time, I think is interesting, and that's the sort of thing that, if you were just to read the article out of context of a photocopy of it, you, you you kind of miss out on that sort of cultural aspect of it. So that's, I think that's you know kind of worth considering. The um, but if we look at the articles themselves, I have to say I've made notes of the questions. Um, how does that how does the article characterize Pollock? What, what was there, and you can kind of combine that with the tone of the article, I think too. Um, how was the writer and the, the magazine in general presenting Pollock to the public favorably? Just I didn't really see the author or the mm -hmm. journalist being one way or another. Mm -hmm. I felt like they like, kept themselves very neutral, but just said like some people love his stuff, some people do like it. Did he just say that the fact is like just, he did generalize, which is bad for journalism, but like mm -hmm. the general public did not really feel like I felt like they never used like I feel this or I feel that, which is mm -hmm. not supposed to. Yeah, and that's um, yeah, and that's especially maybe more true than the past, and it, it's been this day to some extent. Um, and then there's a difference between uh, like a journalistic article like that and say a commentary, you know, an editorial commentary. You know, you would have the eye, you know, present. So yeah, I think there, you know, there's definitely that neutral tone. Anybody else want to add to me to that song of hands? Yeah, actually, I think I can start. It's uh, back to you. They had, I noticed that they had two opinions. He starts off saying that he's one of the candidates to be the greatest uh, American painter. 20th century, but I feel like he focused more on his uh, statement after that, which was that he produces nothing more than interesting, if inexplicable, decorations. Yeah. I felt like that's kind of like the way that the article read. Yeah. Like yeah. It was, the article seemed more like it was introducing Pollock to the general population, like, hey, this new guy, he's getting pretty popular, like, y'all maybe you should check him out, but like, too serious about this abstract expression. Yeah, so it feels a little, and there's a kind of ambivalence, you know, mm -hmm. quality to it. Um, I think the use of the word interesting is interesting. <laughs> um, interesting can be a death knell, you know, in a way. You know, somebody, and, and I don't know where I've read that. It, it's a quote from somebody, or I saw it in an interview, you know, maybe an artist or a, a critic or somebody made this comment that you never want somebody to say your work is interesting, right? Because they're avoiding being more honest about it. Yeah. So, and I think about that. Some of those are like, oh, it's so interesting. I was like, ooh, I should read that word. So, um, Amy, you were going to ask. Um, I don't know. It seemed like the the, the author was kind of like patronizing him. Yeah. I mean, he was talking about him like he was like this rare species of bird that we can never see him again. You know? Not that we like actually care about him, but it's this new thing. Mm -hmm. And so the way he was talking about his work was just kind of like, like I, I would make eyes. Mm -hmm. Just like this is what he does, and it's so strange and obscure, but we don't know if we like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that that ambivalent tone comes through. You can add, yeah. I just uh, I'm yeah. to kind of catch on her coattails there. That it sounded condescending to me in in a way. But I think there was even I don't have it in front of me, but there was a mention of he paints in a barn. You know, mm -hmm. and what why did he have to say it that way? I felt like. Yeah, yeah. Like, he lives in the country, whatever's lying around. Yeah, he throws in like yeah. some cigarette butts or nuts and bolts or whatever. Yeah, it's like the art's actually. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's then we'll call it. Were you starting to say something else too, or you just follow it? No, I feel like the author doesn't quite understand the process, and so therefore it doesn't make him condescending. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I do feel like that he's speaking to the general public, which mm -hmm. may not have totally gone on to the concept. Yeah, and potentially, you know, since it's been, you have to think of the readership of the magazine really is this broad, you know, American readership. Um, in general, you know, readers for the most part too. And I think if you, it, it, I, it, I can see the strategy that if you kind of, the tone of the article was just totally, you know, on board, you know, glorifying this artist, that some people might shut down and be like, whoa, wait a minute. So I, I can see where the writer is trying to maybe write from the point of view of the reader, you know, or trying to uh, understand that point of view. Did anybody um, catch that last sentence? I didn't print it out and bring it with me, but um, that, in the last sentence, it talked about Pollock finishing the painting. It kind of you know, comes back to this kind of condescending. No, but that, yeah. I remember um, he uses the words, uh, like, he's describing his method as brooding and doodling. Yeah, right? And I thought that was very wonderful. It says, finally, after days of oh, brooding and doodling, Pollock decides the painting is finished with the gumption to do other work which remains. Yeah, right? Yeah. And that, it's like, that's a little snarky, right? I thought it was complimentary. I don't know where all the condescension is coming from. Really? I yeah, it was a good line. Yeah. Like, that was mine. I would have been insulted if it was written about me. Yeah. Like, I live in the countryside, and I work in this beautiful thing outside of my big, like, country home. Yeah, okay, it could be, it could be a bar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's good, okay, because I think that, because I do feel like the tone overall is positive, and then there's these little, especially that last sentence, because on, if you read it one way, it seems perfectly fine. But if you really think about what the writer just said, is you know, and it's true, you know, the only the artist ever knows, you know, when a painting is done, you know, and that's a hard thing to know, even if you're doing something very traditional, you know, in an academic sense. But I, but I felt like the underlying tone was, it's so abstract. How do you know? You know, how do I how do I tell if the painting is you know is finished or not? So what I think would be interesting is you're as you as people are reading it, and I mean it like you, but also people are reading it back in nineteen you know fifty, um, is probably your attitudes are going to filter or affect how you read the article. Like, is it a really positive article? Is it you know something a little different? You know, is it is it a combination of the two? So I think it's, the tone. It's, I feel like the tone is subtle and not subtle, but I find it to be very fun. Uh, and that's I think one of the reasons I thought it would be it would be interesting to read. Uh, but anyway, I'm glad you bring up that point of the um, that it's, it's a positive article because it is. You know, in a lot of ways, it's, it's positively presented. But then there's these little you know uh, comments that you know it's sort of I prick at my ears. You know, reading it. Hmm, what is it? You know, how, how am I supposed to? Um, how am I supposed to interpret that? Um, as you looked at the the second article, the one that talked about the show that was controversial. How did you how did you find that work? I thought I see how I phrase that here. Um, yeah, well, um, with that one, you certainly could read it, but I really wanted you to kind of look at the work, you know, and compare it to what we've talked about so far, uh, more than anything. But how did how did that work compare to what we've talked about in class so far? How did it, that strike you? It was abstract, not not, not representation. Yeah, it was abstract and and representational. So actually, yeah, yeah. So there's so yeah, it's instead of being yeah. <laughs> Um, anything else you want to add? Uh, yeah. Uh, I feel like um, like color is really handy here to make it easy, kind of safer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some of that, I, I wonder how much of that has to do with the way the magazine was printed. Like, I don't, yeah, you know what I mean? The, uh, and I, and, I, that in my, um, in and that's a little hard to tell because that, that muted quality of the images is so consistent. And those are artists that I'm not as familiar with, so I don't have, I don't have that. Information in my head to know. Oh, that you know that color is off. Or even if the layout, layout team decided to do similar tones and colors in order to. Right. So I think I think that's a. I mean that's a. It, it's unclear, but the way certainly the way it's presented is you know is different. Yeah. Another thing on that that I noticed, the images seem to be just like a darker mm -hmm. tone overall, even kind of from the emotional aspect. Yeah, in a more psychological know. sense, yeah. So they're darker, definitely abstract, but not, not that, I say it right, not, not non-representational. Um, so still, you know, representational images. One of the things, that, and part of my reason, too, for drawing your attention to that, you know, the work that got juried in, because all of these artists who are really kind of pushing the edges decide they're not going to participate in it. Um, and, you know, so that changes the dynamic of things.
uh, in terms of you know who might have gotten you know the you know, jury in and gotten the awards and so on. But uh, on Wednesday, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about European artists in the post-war period. So we'll see what's happening in, in Europe in you know, the in the, in the 19, you know, the late part of the nineteen forties and also crossing into the nineteen. <laughs> and I think that you're, you'll see there's some really distinctive differences. There's some similarities, certainly, but some differences. But the artists who are in, the, in that Metropolitan show, I feel like their work in some ways is, is similar to what European artists are doing around the same time period. And so that, I think that's worth considering. So I kind of wanted you to have um, those uh, differences in your uh, head, too. Um, any, any questions or comments before we shift away from discussion and, and talk about some new artists? Yeah. Besides like the New York School during this mm -hmm. time period and those who were really trying to branch out, mm -hmm. were, was it still typical for Americans to study what was happening in Europe and what's going on over oh, there? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's still, um, you know, and even into our own time, we're doing it as well. You know, the um, art students, you know, you go on, you know, on a trip in the summer or study abroad or that kind of thing. There's um, there's still this pull, you know, toward Europe. It's it's different though. You might see people traveling more broadly even today. Um, but definitely through the you know through the 50s and 60s, you've got you know artists commonly you know seeing you know going to Europe, seeing what's happening. But maybe more, but what's hap I get probably what's happening at the more you move forward in time, um, you're going to Europe to look at the past, you know. So um, as you're coming up to mid-century, people are wanting to go to Europe to see what the new trends are and see what's new and fresh to so I think about, you know, going to New York City and seeing what the shows are and who's getting in the galleries and what kind of work's being representative. And I think that the, the further you move away from around 1945 or even that being at a breaking point um, in the, using the war as kind of a uh, halfway point, um, it's, it, it's less so. Um, but it also depends on what artists you're talking about, because as we, as we get to the 1960s, we'll talk about conceptual art, and there's some really significant developments in conceptual art in, Par in Paris, actually. Um, and so in some ways, that's still influential. But because of the nature of conceptual art and performance art, it's less... Um, you know, it's less American artists being there, seeing it, as they are reading about it and knowing what's going on. Because it's, it's things that happen in one day or a week or something like that, or multiple performances, and if you're not there, you know, then you're not able to experience it. But it's getting better and better. And that's kind of a long-winded answer. <laughs> so, but, you know, it isn't kind of a night and day break, but it's, you know, it's certainly happening across time. Anything else? Uh, what we're going to do today is talk about some sculptures. So we, we talk about abstract expressionism and painting. One of the things about abstract expressionism, as a you know, as a stylistic movement, is it's it's really dominated by painting. So if you if you talk about abstract expressionist work in, in general, uh, you're, most people are going to visualize painting, and that's really where a lot of attention is is paid. But there are also sculptors who get talked about as abstract expressionists or representing abstract expressionist trends in um, sculpture. And, there, and there's a lot of variety, I think, between um, these artists. And so they're, they're working within this time period, but um, they're, and even the abstract expressionist painters weren't necessarily a really tight, cohesive group, but they were working in the same places, showing in the same shows, having conversations, um, and so on. The sculptors, I think, are you know, a little bit looser um, in that way. The first artist we're going to talk about is David Smith, and he, um, this is a kind of several, or actually two works by him, but two views of, of one of them. Um, the one on the left is called Royal Bird, and if you look carefully, uh, this photograph was taken uh, shortly after it was made. If you look carefully, you'll see this is the, the uh, steel structure that you see here. It's attached, um, there's a little metal you know, kind of piece or part of it that attaches it to a base. Uh, and then you can see a, a kind of blurry in the background of the building um, off into the distance. So, and, and I make note of this because as we'll see with Smith's work, he was really interested in artwork or in sculpture being out of doors rather than being in a gallery setting. So we'll talk about this one a little bit. And then the other work here is called The Letter. Um, I think this, I have this detail I have in black and white shows you the, the sculpture, I think, in terms of the surfaces and the, and the, the work overall better. Um, but this image here, which is not as high in resolution, gives you a you know, kind of sense of color. Um, so that's why I've got those two uh, side by side. When Smith 
begins um, creating work in the 40s, uh, he's making work that's more like this. It's really evocative. In some ways, it's representational. Uh, and what you'll see through his work is that he moves away from that and toward um, non-representational work and toward more geometric work. Um, but one of the things that he's doing is he's literally um, hack welding scrap pieces of metal and scrap pieces of iron and, and uh, steel together. With royal bird here, it creates the, this form. It almost looks like kind of the skeleton of a bird, like we've got a head and neck and vertebrae, you know, ribs, you know, and feet and, and so on. <coughs> it's also the way it's displayed. It seems like it's you know floating in space or maybe even uh, moving uh, through space. The other work, the letter, again, all these you know, kind of various little scrap pieces. Um, and in some cases, even welds old tools and pieces of tools and broken tools um, into the um, into the works as well. It um, it almost reads as registers, or almost like a hieroglyphic in a way. Uh, if you think of Egyptian hieroglyphics or even cuneiform, they're organized into sections and and rows, and this has that quality to it. And the forms that you see, they seem very regular, you know, and, and spaced out like you're looking at glyphs or, or letters. Even the title of it makes a reference to it. Um, but yet it doesn't represent a, a known language or any you know, particular kind of language. This idea of working in um, metal and packing it together, uh, working in both iron and steel, it, you know, in this time frame isn't all that new. Um, Picasso was doing, uh, Picasso and another Spanish artist named, um, um, what is it? It's either Juan or Julio. I think it's Julio Gonzalez. Um, we're also doing something similar in the 1920s and starting in the 20s where they're getting, you know, scrap metal and reassembling it uh, in a new way. And the term for that is called assemblage. So you can talk about assemblage sculpture. Uh, but it really, um, it's, kind of, it's really much more on the fringes before World War II. After World War II, this idea of assemblage becomes much more notable. Um, we can see Smith working on this. We'll see other artists and, and sculptors working with this idea of assemblage. And it will become a, an important part of pop art uh, as well, especially um, as pop art develops in the 1950s. You can, I should mention, too, you can also, you may also hear assemblage referred to as assemblage, and that's more of a, a kind of a French pronunciation. Um, so if you hear somebody talk about assemblage in you know, a kind of a lofty way, um, you know, it's essentially referring to the same thing. Um, the other thing about David Smith is that before he was working full time as an artist, uh, he was working as a commercial welder. So um, he had you know, really good welding skills, and but he was also surrounded by scrap metal all the time. Uh, and so that's, that's one of the reasons why he starts working with this cast off material. So I think today, for those of you who may have taken, has anybody taken a sculpture class where you like metal fabrication? Do you work with scrap? Is there, are there projects where you work with scrap metal? I've got a whole like, scrap graveyard. Yeah, you guys kind of scrounge around and find things and, and work with it. That idea you know, really come, it comes from this time frame. And really, in a lot of ways, comes from David Smith and certainly some other artists. Um, so I think today, we're fairly comfortable with that idea that you find cast off materials and you know, kind of magically you know, convert it you know, into something else, uh, you know, via art or, or art practice. Um, but in this time frame, this is a, a newer, you know, kind of um, challenging idea in terms of um, what you can do with art. He also creates a whole series of sculptures collectively that are referred to as sentinels. Um, the idea of a sentinel is like a, a guardian or somebody who's watching, uh, you know, kind of uh, keeping an eye on things. And this is a photograph of one of the sentinels in a museum setting. This is a photograph uh, that David Smith took. He, uh, he worked on a, he, or rather he had a farm in upper state New York, so he spent like a, or, or his property was on an old farm, but he wasn't farming necessarily. Uh, but basically he had lots of big space and a barn, you know, that he used as a studio. Um, this is on, you know, his property here, and, and as I mentioned with the Royal Bird sculpture, he was interested in this idea of art being outside or art, you know, being um, in the out of doors. And he basically placed a lot of his sculptures on the property of the farm, um, and, you know, and documented them through photographs. And um, at the time of his death, which was in, I think in the 1960s, he died, he died relatively young. I think he died from a heart attack sort of unexpectedly. Um, a lot of his sculptures were, you know, were still on that property. And quite a few of them were purchased by Storm King Art Center, which is also in upstate New York. And it's, it's basically a sculpture park. So it's this 
very you know park like you know natural setting with sculptures kind of you know, all over the, the place around it. Um, and so they co they collectively bought a lot of his work and then just kind of recited it from one natural setting to another. Uh, one of the things about the Sentinels is they're also you know, that cast off material that we talk about this is assemblage uh, that's um, repositioned. They all seem in some way to refer to the human figure. They kind of read as I mean the title makes a reference to a, a person standing and watching, you know, so the title makes a reference to that. But when you look at them collectively, they all sort of have this feeling. They're all, you know, vertical. They all sort of have legs, torsos, or heads, some of them, you know, at least, or, or variants of that. Um, the other thing about them is with a photograph like this, it's a little hard to get a sense of scale, but they're all pretty much in, in human scale. So in terms of the sizes of them, they range between, like, you know, five to eight feet or so. They're not particularly big. When you see a photograph like this, it's hard to tell. This could be 16 feet tall, it could be 4 feet tall. You know, without um, something for context, it's a little difficult to tell. And that's important to understand because Smith had this idea that, and, and he's also referencing the history of, of sculpture, and sculpture largely, if you, you know, just flip through a, you know, a survey or a history book and look at the sculptures in it, and you'll realize that most of the sculptures are figurative. Um, it doesn't really change until you get into um, the 20th century and abstract and the development of abstraction. Um, but there's this really deep, you know, um, tradition, and so and Smith in some ways seems to be making references to that, you know, simply in the scale of the forms themselves. This um, this next work really jumps us forward in time a little bit, but I think it's it's worth talking about because this takes us into the 60s, and we're really talking um, more about work in the 40s. And, early 1950s. But the direction that Smith goes over time is he, he moves away from these assemblage uh, pieces to these these forms, which collectively are known as the cubic series, which makes sense. You see all these you know, you know, cube-like forms. Um, these, are, these are more manufactured pieces. So rather than using cast-off metal, which is re, you know, um, you know, kind of piecing together in different ways, uh, he's working with stainless steel, which is a, an industrial <coughs> material, um, you, know, you know, welding, you know, these um, forms together. And if you look carefully, um, you can also see, I'll show you another image in just a moment where you can see it better. He's also running a grinder across the surface of the steel, so they don't, they're not just these mirror-like um, um, forms, but they have, um, they have some texture uh, to them as well. And again, if you notice here, these are, these are ones that were on his, um, property at the time of his death. And if you notice the way that the point of view from the camera is relatively low, uh, the way it's the way this photograph is taken, so you've got you know that you're sort of you know ground line here, but you're looking out into the landscape, the point of view of the camera's relatively low. And it makes these feel more monumental than they actually are. Uh, and again the height of these is maybe you know somewhere between um, six to seven feet. And so they're rough, they're more to the scale of the, of the human being. I feel like work like this could scale up exponentially. You know, this could be 20 feet tall, um, or it could be you know, smaller uh, than we see it here. But again, with Smith, that keeping things to the size of a human being is something significant. I think you can get a, maybe a better sense of scale here, but also the surface treatment um, of the sculptures and the, the fact that they are stainless steel. There's, uh, this, the surface is on his work has almost been, has sometimes been talked about as being the abstract expressionist part you know, you know, of the sculpture in a way, these kind of you know, curving or you know, organic lines and so on. Uh, and I think it's an interesting part of the work because they're so geometric, right? They're, these, they're really almost kind of like exercises and balance and you know, composition, um, but they are so rigid and, and geometric, but it's the surface of the steel that in some ways adds a different kind of energy. You know, and, and that, again, that's a, just a, a two-dimensional or kind of a surface finish rather than the, the three-dimensional finish itself. Um, the next one we'll talk about is uh, Isamu Nakuchi. Uh, he's also a, an interesting and really varied artist. He, uh, you know, one of the things about David Smith, he, he dies relatively young, so you know, his body of work is curtailed um, at, at his death in the 60s. And um, but Isamu Nakuchi lives uh, a very long time and his career really begins in the early part of the 20th century and then crosses over um, into the later half of the century. And I think that, I can't remember when he died, it's like the 1980s, it might have been in the late 80s. So he really um, literally traverses a number of styles, and we'll talk about that in his work. I want to show you this one here, and then we're going to move away from it and we'll come back to it. 
Um, and because what I want to do is put this work into context with the, the larger um, kind of run uh, of his career. Uh, this is a, a work that's in your textbook, and it's one of his uh, better known pieces, especially from this time period in the 1940s, uh, called uh, Chorus. So keep this in mind, because we'll come back to it in just a moment. Um, another interesting thing about Noguchi is um, literally his background. Um, he's considered an American artist, but he, um, his parents were Japanese, and he was actually, um, you know, so the kind of the pattern of his life is interesting. He was born in the United States. His, his father was working in the U.S. in Southern California. So he was born in the U.S. when he was 8 or 10 years old or so. Um, his family moved back to Japan. So, um, so then he's raised in Japan kind of through, through his childhood. Um, then as a young adult, he comes back to the United States, to New York City, studies art there, and then um, goes to Paris and studies uh, art in Paris as well. So as an artist, he's really global in a lot of ways, and he's reflecting a lot of traditions of Japanese art and more of what we think of as like Japanese aesthetics, especially craftsmanship, and this concern for craftsmanship is really keen. Um, but he also represents you know, American art, and he represents European trends as well. So he kind of bridges East and West and the United States you know, kind of as, a, as a median point. Um, I want to show you these three images side by side because they, they show this huge change you know, in his work across time. When he first begins working as an artist, he's working in a really traditional way, in a really academic way. So this is a sculpture that he completes. This is when he, he went to a, an art program in New York. And I think it was called like the Rembrandt School or the Leonardo, uh, not Rembrandt, the, it's the uh, Leonardo da Vinci School of Art or something like that. Uh, in New York, just by the, the name, you know, it would tell you it's a very traditional kind of program. So this is a plaster sculpture that he created as his, um, it, it, it wasn't like what we think it was a four-year you know, university today, but it would have been the equivalent of like his senior project, you know, or his master work that he produces in this program. So everything about this sculpture is, you know, just very, very traditional in an academic sense. You know, it's figurative, it's naturalistic, it's, you know, kind of poetic or lyrical. In a way, it's kind of you know typical of work coming out of the um, uh, you know, again traditional academic work coming out of the 19th century. Um, in the later part of the 1920s, he moves to Paris. Um, this is his work that he was doing around that time period, and here you can see it's completely geometric. I mean, and you know, there's some work done, of course, but it's mostly geometric and largely not representational. <coughs> The artist he comes into contact with in Paris is um, Constantine Brancusi. And so, if, if, just as a reminder, this is a photograph of Brancusi in his studio at about the same time period uh, in some of his you know, famous sculptures, in like Birth in Space, that you see here. Famously, um, Brancusi liked to work in different materials, um, in non traditional materials, in terms of, of what was you know, considered traditional in the fine arts. So Brancusi certainly worked in marble and, and um, bronze, which was traditional, but he also worked with other stones like limestone and alabaster, uh, which were less you know, common in terms of high art. And he also worked with wood, which was also considered to be you know, kind of relegated more toward craft or folk art as opposed to the fine arts. And he also worked in these repeated forms and stacked forms as well in combining materials together. So when you look at this image of Noguchi in his studio at this time period, you can really see where he's absorbing and really reflecting uh, Brancusi's interests. Um, one thing that Brett Brancusi is, for being a European artist, he's also really, really interested in craftsmanship <coughs> and the history of craft in a way that I think um, Noguchi, as a, as a Japanese, you know, person of Japanese um, descent and ethnicity and culture, you know, culturally, um, there's a, this... In Japan culture, there's this intense interest in craftsmanship and the history of craft and design as well. So I think it makes sense. I think why he's so interested in Noguchi, uh, or so interested in Brancusi. And then when you come in here into the 40s in the sculpture of the Koros, um, he's coming back to the figure because he's actually representing. Oops, uh, oops one more minute, second. He's representing a human form, but again in a really abstract way. So he's an artist with a really broad range. Um, the other thing about Noguchi is we'll touch on him again later in the semester. He um, also does a number of projects that are 
like garden type projects or garden design projects, so he thinks about um, art or his art develops or runs in a way that begins to think about installation and environmental art. Um, so we'll touch on him there. Uh, I'm hoping I haven't gotten my my uh, my schedule requests for the fall approved yet, um, but I'm hoping to teach a uh, my land art class, which I'm getting a new title in the fall, um, which is Art in the Environment, um, which kind of reflects the content better. But if you're interested in that topic, it's just sort of a, you know, a heads up. Um, we'll talk quite a bit about Noguchi within this context, because he's an artist who's doing um, a lot of interesting things in the environment and in, in the natural environment as well. So he's pretty significant. Uh, again, you know, covering vast expanses of time. Uh, but if we kind of stay closer to the timeline, so we get, we're talking about Noguchi here developing in the 20s, um, in the 30s, he's working in New York, and he begins to get some really significant uh, commissions. One of them is to do this bas relief sculpture uh, for what was the, originally the Associated Press Building. Today, it's um, I'm not sure if it's still the Bank of America Building. When this photograph was taken, it was the Bank of America Building. Um, so it's a, an entry, you know, it's a doorway into the building here. There's this huge sculpture over the top. Um, Noguchi had, in the 30s, it worked for the WPA program. And the style of this sculpture is very much in the style um, that we associate with the WPA. It's, um, it, it's also oftentimes referred to as Art Deco as well. And Art Deco as a style is something that develops in the 20s and you tend to see through the 30s. What's typical of it, about it is that it has this kind of abstractive quality or at, at a level of abstraction that's very modern. Um, but it also tends to be, you know, from a design standpoint in terms of art, also tends to be um, representational at the same time. Um, one of the ways that Art Deco is often talked about is it's pretty comfortable for the masses. It reads as modern and new and you know, all those positive associations, but it, it doesn't go too far. You know, it doesn't push things so far into abstraction that it becomes um, uncomfortable or, or hard to understand. So what we see here is um, that in terms of the imagery that he's working with, is making references, um, you know, to journalists, right? They're on telephones, you know, new technology, you know, phone time, uh, you know, newer technology. So they're talking, uh, writing things down. Even makes references to the printers. There's a photographer in the background. So he's making references to the, you know, to the, um, the you know, what the what the profession, you know, essentially is all about. The, uh, so this is work from the 30s. Again, this is commissioned work, and so it's, it's notable that it's in the popular style of the time, and especially for an institution um, like the Associated Press. They want to be seen as contemporary, um, but not, you know, not, too, not kind of pushing the edges too much. They still want, to, you know, they still want the imagery to be understandable. So, um, so to come to this work here, this work has a number of connections uh, to New York or um, being in New York uh, in, a, in a, a number of ways uh, in the present day, but it's also making references to the past and to the ancient past in particular. So does anybody know what a Koros is? Is it because that's that that title helps you to understand the work? What is a Koros? Is it like a garden statue? Yeah. Yeah. Usually, there was like a grave marker. Yes, generally so. It's if you look at the um, the history of Greek art, they um, chorus developed in the archaic period, and they serve as a precedent for the development of the figure into the classical period, when the the, the human figure um, really becomes you know starts to look much more naturalistic and. You know, the development of the contrapposto you know, stands and so on. These, this is the type of sculpture that prefigures those. And um, originally they seem to have a function as a, as a grave marker. Um, so poros refer, refers to something very, very particular. It refers to this kind of sculpture. Um, this, this particular poros is a very, is a, well, a very well known one. And, um, and it's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And, and, and it was in the collection at the time that Noguchi was living there and working. So I think that's worth considering because the, the idea of a chorus figure is it's a standing male nude figure, you know, particular to you know, ancient Greek, um, classical Greek culture, and um, out of stone. And that's essentially, um, you know, what this sculpture is, but in an abstracted way or in an abstract sense. The, the other thing about Noguchi's chorus is that what he's done is he's created um, the sculpture out of thin slabs of marble, 
And, and notably, too, and the reason why I wanted to show you this particular chorus is the color of the stone of this chorus is very similar to the marble. Um, it's not the same type of marble, necessarily, um, but the coloration of the marble is similar. And so I think to a New York viewer, especially you know, somebody who's you know, familiar, certainly somebody familiar with art in general, but familiar with the Met and the collection of the Met and the sculpture, you know, potentially you know, would see you know, connections uh, between one to the other. The, um, and actually, I think, I'm trying to remember, I think this is in the Met. I think this eventually was collected, so they're in the same collection today. Um, the space looks like the Met, but um, not exactly the way it looks. It's similar, but not exactly the way it looks today. The, um, the other thing to keep in mind here is what, so he's working with these slabs of stone, uh, and they're all designed in such a way that it's assembled together, so all the pieces kind of interconnect. Um, there are no pens uh, or, no, or no adhesives that are used. So it's literally the pieces are cut out and then um, carefully assembled together. You could probably take this apart and lay it flat uh, as well. So I think that's worth, worth knowing. Because if you think about Noguchi and that interest in craftsmanship and the importance of craftsmanship, um, it's in this piece and it's, and, it, and, it's important, and it's an important part of the piece or understanding it. Um, the other thing, too, and this is a, a part of the sculpture that I think is kind of inspiring, is that even though Noguchi is active and working and he's getting these significant commissions right around this time period, he's still a really young and up-and-coming artist. So he's, he's an artist who didn't have a lot of money um, to work with. And the reason why he started working with this stone is that he was able to get it really cheap. Because what this stone was, um, was uh, basically a stone that was used for the veneer of buildings. And so say you've got a building that's being remodeled or being constructed and then a nice marble you know, facing on it, they use these you know, thin slabs of veneer instead of big, you know, thick um, blocks of stone. And he um, had found a, um, a provider, I don't think it was the quarry itself, but I think it was the stone company that was providing uh, this kind of stone. And they had pieces that were designed to go on buildings that either had been rejected because of flaws or coloration, uh, or they were just some pieces that had been broken you know, in, the pro in the process of working with the stone. So basically, he was getting rejected cast off stone and then converting it into, into something else. So he was getting the, getting the stone at a, at a good uh, discount and cheaper you know, than if he had you know, gone to uh, purchase some packed pieces. So I, you know, I think it's worth knowing about because sometimes it's the Kind of constrictions, you know, that you have to work with as an artist, whatever those may be, um, that sometimes lead to great insight or you know really lead to great developments because you've got you know whatever that restriction is, you've got to figure it's problem solving. You've got to figure out how to work with it and really um, you know, kind of make it the best thing you can. Uh, so again, I remember when they get you, you know, this is indicative of his work in the forties, but um, we will come back to him. Um, we get to a, a later point, um, a, a later point in time. But again, we just kind of touch on it. Uh, the next part is we'll talk about, we'll, um, actually we'll talk about her just a little bit, and then I have a short video I'm going to show you. It's a few minutes long. I, I'll keep an eye on the clock. We may or may not be able to watch the video and see how long it is. Um, Louise Pershawn is also a really significant artist, um, and like Noguchi, she's working through the 20th century. Um, she really starts to get some critical attention in the 40s, but her career doesn't really take off until the 1980s. And in the 1980s, she's like in her, I think she was like in her 70s, I think, at that point. Um, I'm just curious, how many of you are familiar with Louise Bourgeois? Is that she's somebody who's, the, the, the boss of the familiarity with? When you think of Louise Bourgeois, what do you think of? Yeah, the spider sculptures. Um, anything, anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, she does. And the spider sculptures are her later work, and they're really beautiful and creepy, so all at the same time, big, bronze, creepy sculptures. Um, and actually, maybe I've since, since I mentioned them today or on Wednesday, I'll, I'll bring in an image of one of those. Her, um, so when you get, when you look at her career, it's expand, you know, it's, it's really expansive and it's indicative of different time periods. When she first starts working or starts, you know, as a, a mature adult making art, she's working in the 1930s and her work is very surrealist in nature. This, this kind of continues, I think, across um, her body of work. Um, she creates this work here, which is a whole series of um, drawings and paintings that are collectively referred to as the Calme Maison. And um, that means so these, these are some from, or this image here is from 1947. This one here is actually a little bit earlier um, than the drawing. And um, 
the, the word femme maison means woman house. And so what she was interested in, or the idea that she was getting at, she creates this image, this kind of strange, surrealistic image that's part woman, part house. It's kind of like a minotaur or something that's you know, part animal, part human. In this case, it's part you know, um, structure and part human. Um, come, came from her idea of, and her kind of frustration at how women were restricted by gender roles and that women were restricted to the zone of the house or the sphere of the house. And, and I think it's interesting too, when you look at her career, she's significant, she's getting some attention, you know, she's making work, you know, she's selling work, she's an artist who's making a living as an artist across decades, but she doesn't really get an enormous attention until the 1980s. And that really comes um, after feminist art is really developing and there are art historians who are beginning to ask questions, well, what are women doing? You know, why, are, why, you know, why aren't we talking about women artists and so on? And then suddenly, you know, to, to the, uh, I think a large part of the, the art world, it just seemed like she just sort of popped up out of, this old woman making art, you know, kind of popped up out of nowhere. Um, and the reality was that she was working, you know, very steadily, uh, you know, from the 1930s forward. Um, so the works are, you know, interesting, these strange qualities, you know, some of them seem maybe comfortable with the house, others seem constrained by it, or these kind of flame, you know, like structures. Uh, emanating um, the top or arms, you know, other kinds of appendages uh, sticking out. The uh, another work from this time period, and she also she's also an interesting artist, I think, too, because she works across media. She does um, she makes drawings, she makes prints, she does more um, more water based paintings and say oil based paintings. Uh, she creates sculptures. She works in stone. She casts in bronze. She does installations before the, even the idea of installation was really fully caught on. Um, so she's really, when you look at everything that she makes, it's, you know, she's kind of a, uh, a I'm just going to say a jack of all trades, but I guess you know, jack of all trades when you say that. Um, she also created a whole series of sculptures that she referred to as per, uh, personage. And uh, again, in these very abstract forms, in some ways, the, the shape and structure is, is kind of similar. I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment. But it's similar to these, where we see these, you know, kind of object-like forms, but then with legs attached to them, these kind of tall vertical forms. And you see that same kind of patterning in these sculptures here. These are a combination, just in terms of material. They're carved wood. Um, they also have like a, a plaster slip over the surface of them, and then they're painted as well. So we can think of them today as more like a mixed media um, piece. And they, they read as objects, um, you know, kind of inanimate objects, but they also read as figures as well. And they're designed to be moved around and installed in different ways. So if you look carefully, you'll see that if you just kind of focus on the upper part, it just shows you the whole piece. Um, but the, the arrangement of these figures here as the lower forms is different um, than what you see here. So the idea is they actually sit on a, there's like a post in the base that you can lift them up and um, move them around. And that's part of the piece, is that they shouldn't always be um, just in one fixed piece, but they could be arranged um, differently. And I think for this time frame, or this time frame, that's a, that's a little bit unusual. And that's a, certainly a, a different idea. I think we'll, we'll go, it's, we've got a couple of minutes, but I'll go ahead and break there. When we come back on Wednesday, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Louis Bourgeois. I'll have a short video um, that was shot in the early 90s, and she's in her... Um, her home and studio are kind of one and the same. Um, and she's she's really, I, I love watching videos of her, as you'll see, because she's really interesting, really articulate, and she bosses people around, which is kind of fun to watch, too. So she always talks to the camera people, like, where's my coat?